Good morning, and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I'm Emily Nimsikand here at the Nebraska Library Commission, filling in for your regular host, Krista Burns. Encompass Live is the Nebraska Library Commission's weekly online event. It covers a variety of library activities and topics presented by NLC staff sometimes, or sometimes guest speakers like we have today. These one-hour sessions are free, and they're offered every Wednesday at 10 a.m. Central Time, and they include things like presentations, interviews, book reviews, web tours, mini training sessions, Q&A sessions, basically they cover a lot of different things. Um, today, as I mentioned, we do have a guest speaker, Sally Gibson from Creighton University is here to talk to us about letting the patron drive. Take it away, Sally. All right, thank you, Emily. Hi, I'm, as Emily mentioned, I'm Sally Gibson. I'm head of technical services at the Reinhardt Alumni Library at Creighton University. Creighton University has three libraries, and at the Reinhardt is the undergraduate and graduate school. We'll deal primarily with the arts and sciences and the business students. And so we decided to start with demand-driven acquisitions and patron-driven acquisitions. I hope many of you are familiar with those terms. Uh, we began in May 2011. And so I kind of want to give you an update, an overview of why we decided to try this, uh, how it's going, what our concerns are, and where we're hoping to go in the future. So we'll start with, let me get my, there we go. All right, let me start with collection development at the Reinhardt Library. And f we have our book budget that we divide between the departments and the library, and 75% of that book budget is given to the various departments in the arts and sciences and business. So our faculty are the main selectors for our collection. And they have multiple approaches to selecting materials for the library. Some departments um, gather and submit their orders at the end of the deadline, which we give them for March. And so they'll do nothing throughout the year, and then we'll just get all their orders towards the end of the year. Others will work throughout the year and submit orders and kind of continually build the collection as the academic year is going on. Others will just send over the publisher catalog and tell us, order everything that's in here, which, as you know, it really shows that they thought about the process. And, things like that. So it's up to the librarians to kind of fill in the gaps, look for the multidisciplinary titles they're getting lost, uh, kind of look for introductory materials. Uh, we have a collection development librarian who noticed that for the foreign language materials, no one was really going through and getting basic grammar books on those various foreign languages. They were able to fill in there. And we also kind of try to look for things on current events and current awareness so that our collection's up to date. Now the faculty, many of them are really enjoy being selectors and are very proud with the relationship that they have with the library and they really feel that it's building a stronger collection with their input. We get kind of frustrated sometimes because I certainly last year for the 2012 fiscal year, uh, communication studies, they're ones that tend to wait till the end of the year and submit their orders, and they ended up not submitting any orders for the entire year. And so then we had to go in and kind of pick some titles up in communications since they hadn't submitted any orders. We don't have a print approval plan, which I know is common at many university uh, libraries, but we do have a slip plan, and we work with uh, Yankee, which is our primary vendor. And so that kind of gives us some idea of the titles that are coming out and what's going on. So we tend to have, we have a method. Sometimes it feels like it's a little bit of a hodgepodge approach, but we are attempting to build a strong collection, and we certainly are strong in the area of theology. That's been a primary focus at Creighton, and the, that one the theology department feels that they do a very good job and things like that, but we definitely have some areas where we can work on improving. So what's happened with the use of the Reinhardt Collection? And when we were looking at starting demand-driven acquisitions in May of 2001, I kind of went back and looked to see what we had done in 2010-2011. We added 4,872 print titles. We've got the Springer eBook Collection, the entire subject collection. Since we work with the medical school and the medical library, uh, we felt that getting the entire package, even though there'd be some subject areas that weren't of interest to Creighton, 
uh, was the way to go. And so that's really added a large bulk of our ebook titles there. And then we also had the eBury Academic Complete Collection. And we started that about three years ago, and we did the entire subject range. And that's been really popular. Um, we had kind of played with the ebooks in 2000, I think, when everyone got those net library collections and um, kind of was trying out how it was working and things like that. And I think many of us were kind of frustrated with the checkout feature and um, kind of using the interface in general. And so with the eBerry uh, rendition, their interface was easy to use, clean. It's been really successful. It's taken off. It seems to grow each year. Um, in 2010, 2011, our ebook usage increased 29%. This past year, 2011 and 2012, the, it increased 49%. So the students have really are in using that eBerry interface. And they're using those eBooks, and I really felt confident that that was an interface that we could use and work with. Our print circulation is down 5%. So we're kind of holding steady. We're a little bit down, but you know, certainly the eBook usage is taking off, and I think that's where student comfort level is. They want to get in, get out, get their material, have it available, and so we felt that by working with demand-driven acquisitions in ebooks would certainly be successful. So we also looked at kind of our ebook usage versus print usage. And I had a sample of 46 titles that we had held both in print and ebook. It's not our intention to buy titles in both formats, but because of the academic complete collection, we did have some overlap because we'd already purchased the print titles, and then we happened to get an ebook format. So I was able to kind of look at the sample. I did a variety of subject areas just to kind of get an idea of what's happening. You know, certainly I thought the ebook usage would be higher, but it's kind of a mixed bag. We had 17 titles that were not used in either format. 11 were used only in print, 7 only in ebook, and 10 in both formats. And again, it's kind of hard to look at these statistics because as you can see, I had user sessions of 233, I had 24 checkouts, but with the ebook, obviously your statistics are going to count each time someone goes in the book, and then when you've checked it out, you don't know how many times they refer back to it when they uh, use it throughout their checkout period. But it did kind of give an idea, and I would expect the ebook usage to be higher, that anyway, I would hope, and that the you know, checkout period would you just you can see that I checked it out, and that's about it. But I could see that they are using the ebooks, and I had heard from other presentations that I attended that if you had books in both formats, they tend to have higher usage, and um, you know certainly no one has the budget to go and buy all their books in print and ebook, especially when we're trying to build our collections. We want to have as many options and titles available. It doesn't really make sense to use your limited funds on buying a title in two different formats, but. If we happened to have some overlap, then that was a way to certainly examine what was going on. And then I kind of looked at the ebook versus print um, circulation or usage, and I looked at the t uh, looked at some subject areas from 2008 to 2011. For each year, I just looked at the titles that were either checked out or used, and you can see that the ebook usage is growing each year. It's getting it's spending more and more. And biology and business certainly have the highest usage for ebooks, but they're still only in the 50% range. Biology is at 56%, business is at 57%. So the usage of print is not stopping or going away. I mean, they'll gradu they're gradually building to more ebook, but they still have a long way to go in terms of just being a primarily ebook usage of the collection. History and political science are certainly coming on strong. Religion, for 2011, the usage is at 19%. So we do have a strong print collection in the area of theology, religion. But it is building each year. And so most of the subject areas are between 20% and 30% in terms of the ebook usage. So I really felt confident that if we started getting titles, on the demand-driven acquisition platform, that the comfort level with you using ebooks is there, and so we won't have anyone who is not, especially at the student level, who's not comfortable with using an ebook. So why try demand-driven acquisitions? And I will say for the public libraries out there, I, I think they tend to chuckle. This is kind of more of an academic librarian phenomenon. Um, 
public libraries have always kind of bought what their patrons wanted and, and requested, and they've been really in tune with uh, getting what people are asking for. And academic libraries have tended to kind of build and try to have something available just in case, and maybe someone down the road might need it. You know, this might be coming out later on. We need to have it now. And so demand-driven acquisitions is really helping academic libraries move away from the just-in-case to more of a just-in-time phenomenon. And it's certainly giving us more electronic content. Um, people are not wanting to come in and check out the book and go home. They're wanting to you know, look at it online, have it available, refer back to it later. If they're doing their paper at 2 o'clock in the morning, they can go in and get what they need. If, especially if they discover they don't have enough items and they need to do some searching to find some more resources. Also a cost-saving ability. We certainly all have bought the book that did not get used for 10 years and then you ended up weeding it out of your collection. And no one ever opened it. You know, it's in pristine condition, brand new, but no one wanted to look at it. If they haven't looked at it in 10 years, probably not going to ever look at it. And so certainly it was a purchase that didn't need to be made. Also, is this going to change the way our collection development process is done? As I said before, faculty do a lot of the selection. If I've got those titles already in the catalog for people to discover, maybe that will kind of shift some of the collection development onto the students. This also could be an alternative to ILL. Um, you know, if we can just do a short-term loan or even purchase the title, rather than interlibrary loaning, certainly we'll get there a little bit faster. They'll go in, find it, and use it right away. And also, patrons can be better informed about emerging trends, areas of research, and the change in their program direction. Um, sometimes we're a little bit slow to find out what's happening, if there's been a change in focus. New faculty members come in, and maybe they haven't gotten many titles in their subject area before, but they suddenly are doing a class that's got a strong emphasis on this new direction, and we just don't have many items in the library yet. And this is certainly a way to kind of fill in the gap and see what the usage is headed and what people are needing and what they want to have access to. Now, there are some concerns about demand-driven acquisitions. Um, about two years ago, eBrary did a pilot project, and they worked with various libraries throughout the country, and they kind of did a large load of items. I think they were, you had to load like 100,000 titles into your catalog, and then you just kind of went to see what was happening. And Duke University was kind of the horror story. They went through $30,000 in like two weeks or, you know, just this. They put it out there for everyone to use. They wanted to see what was happening, and it kind of was a budget buster. They really went through and did a lot. So we all kind of were like, well, you know, I can't really spend $30,000 two weeks or even a month or even two months and certainly, you know, I certainly can't keep that pace throughout the year. So there are some concerns about, you know, how do you control the budget? You know, how do you monitor? But they, Yankee and any of the programs have some options in place so you can kind of keep, keep a handle on what's happening. Also digital rights management restrictions, you know, are we kind of limiting the use of the titles? Are we unnecessarily causing some problems, certainly when they are coming to, you know, not many people want to print out an entire book, but you still can't do that in many cases. The publishers are limited to a couple chapters, a couple pages, you know, certainly trying to not have people print off all, all the books. And then how large of a pool do you need of the titles? Um, you know, 100,000 titles certainly sounded way large, and I was hearing you know, maybe you needed to do 25,000 titles, maybe you needed to start small and only do 5,000 titles, maybe 1,000 titles, and it was really what was the right mix and what was, what was the best way to go. And at the time we started, uh, people were kind of all over the board. I think every library approaches this differently. You really have to find out what's best for your library and what direction you want to take and what your comfort level is. And also, we didn't want to shortchange our collection. Um, you know, who knows what was going to be bought and were we comfortable with that? We certainly take pride in building a quality collection that meets the needs of the Creighton community, and we want to continue with that path. We don't want to suddenly have titles that really we wouldn't have bought otherwise. So what's the optimum size? So I was pretty conservative for our initial load. I had kind of wanted, wanted to kind of take a 
little tiny step into the pool, you can say. And so I started with about 500 titles for my initial load. And then how long do the titles stay in the pool? Again, everyone's done a wide variety of approaches. Some people leave them in for six months. A couple people are planning for a couple of years. I'm planning on leaving them in there for a couple of years. I really feel a lot of times that the topic comes out, it's used later. Uh, certainly, it's not like it's a bestseller that everyone's hearing the buzz about. These tend to be more academic titles, university presses, and so it's definitely something that they'll discover, and they kind of need a couple of years to discover the titles. And it's not really harming anything to have that title available. And do you want to limit by publishers? You know, certainly this is one way to make sure you only have titles that you are comfortable purchasing. Also, do you want to how many, do you want to do a short-term loan? There's a variety of ways you can set up your program. And many people do the short-term loan and then they'll purchase. And so you can determine how many short-term loans you want or if you don't want to do short-term loans at all. Uh, do you want to set a price cap? Um, you know, certainly if you're not comfortable having someone have the ability to buy a $200 book, you can set the price cap at any level that you're interested in. And then how will the vendor help me? I'm going to need a variety of reports. I need to know what's going on, what's happening with the collection, what's happening with the DDA title pool, um, what kind of feedback and support am I going to get from the vendors, and you know, what am I actually doing and finding out, and I need to know how are they going to help me. And then what's the role of the selector? I think some people are a little concerned that their role as a selector for the library collection is going to diminish if we've just kind of turned it loose to the masses and let anyone uh, pick what they want. And so these are some things to consider, kind of find out, you know, what's going on, what's your comfort level, and see what's happening. So I kind of want to talk about what demand-driven acquisition does. Now, at this point, there are several vendors that provide the service. We're working with Yankee, but EBL provides it, EBSCO provides it, and they all kind of have the same premise. The user will um, have some activity or trigger that causes either a loan or a purchase. And for ours, with Yankee, if someone looks at an ebook for 10 consecutive minutes, then that's going to trigger a short-term loan. Or if they look at 10 unique pages, or if they have a page that's copied or printed, they really have to engage with the material. If they look at the front or the end matter, then that's not going to count as a trigger. Also, if you've got someone who opens the book, looks at the page, and then talks to their friend for 15 minutes, well, eBury software has the ability to determine that, you know, this is really dormant. There's no activity here. And so you won't get charged for someone who uh, opened it, stopped using the material, but you know, certainly met the 10-minute rule. So they have to be actively engaged and actively using the content for you to have a trigger. And then there's uh, three short-term loans that are available. You can do the one-day short-term loan, which is 10% of the list price. You can do a one-week, which is 15% of the list price, and do one month, which is 25% of the list price. And we decided to do the one-day short-term loan to um, kind of see how that was going. I felt, you know, if they got in, they used it again, then we could buy it because they probably are actively engaged with the title. And studies have found that the items picked from patron-driven acquisitions tend to be used again. So that was something I wanted to kind of look at and be aware of. Is, you know, if we did the one-day loan, is that really giving us the optimum for getting the titles that we need that are of use? And that will be used again because we certainly are trying to avoid the long-standing habit with many libraries of buying something that never got used. And then we also worked with Yankee to kind of monitor our plan so that it mirrored our slip plan. We kind of wanted to have a wide variety of subject areas. We set a price cap at $125. Originally, we wanted to do a price cap for uh, humanities, social sciences, and business at 125, and then have the sciences at 175, but we're only able to set one price cap, so we just put it at 125, and that way we kind of would only purchase titles at 125 and below. And then we did the uh, short-term loan, and then we purchased the, the item. We also did the single user option. Now, many people think, oh, ebooks, we need to have multi-user. Um, 
you got, you know, what do you mean there's only one single user, but many of the publishers are only providing a single user option. Um, and so also we really felt that most of the time these the titles that we were purchasing were really only going to be used by one person. Now eBrary is coming out with something this fall where you can kind of upgrade either temporarily or on a permanent basis if you have a title that has a single user option and someone tries to use it when it when someone else is using it, then you can do a short-term loan and that will provide access to the person. But again, this is only available for the titles that the publishers have said, yes, we will allow multi-user options. Or you can set it up so that you can upgrade to the purchase of the multi-user option. Uh, when we started and previously, you had to determine before you even purchase whether you're going to have the single-user option, the multi-user option, and now they're kind of giving you a way to kind of upgrade if possible so that you can go to the multi-user option. But currently with the single user option, you do get a message saying that the title is currently in use and that you can ask to get an alert um, that tells you that the title is available. And I tested it out and when the person closes the book, then the person will get the alert about 15 minutes later. But again, I think there's just something in many people's minds that ebooks should always be available for everyone and they can't believe it's in use. But uh, eBrary has also done several studies that kind of look at the overlap between users is usually minimal. It's not uh, a lot, of, unless you have a class obviously where everyone is supposed to read a chapter and everyone's trying to get in at the same time, then you're going to have overlap. But in general, these books tend to be used by one person at a time and the single user option is usually fine. So we did our first record loads in May of 2011. And again, I said I was rather conservative and I only loaded about 500 titles. And so by October 1st of 2011, I was up to 990 titles. And I was really kind of discouraged. We had some usage, we'd had some purchases, but I didn't have a lot of activity. I was kind of hoping for more activity. And so in December, I decided to kind of do a larger load and change up my profile. And so I added about 10,000 titles um, in December to kind of bring up the pool. And another rule that's kind of emerging that I think is working for Creighton is kind of have double what you would purchase in a year for the print collection. So in 2010, 2011, we bought 4,800 titles. And so by doubling that and having that in our DDA pool, I kind of had double what we had purchased in print. And the next half, kind of the spring semester, we certain our usage went up in terms of the short-term loans and the purchases. And I also decided to allow publishers that did not allow for a short-term loan to be in there. Previously I said, no, if they don't allow for a short-term loan, I don't want them in there because I want to have the option of doing a short-term loan. But in December I added titles that if you used it once, you bought it. So now in September of 2012, we have 10,000 cattle, 10,000 titles in our catalog. They're searchable in the library catalog, they're searchable on the eBrary platform, and then we also have Summon, a web-based discovery service, and they're available there. We're using the eBrary number for the title control number as a way for us to know that this is a DDA title. We also worked with Yankee, and we've put um, demand-driven acquisitions in one of our 900 fields so that we know that's a demand-driven acquisitions title. And the records created, not cataloged. We outsource our authority work, and so I didn't want to send records off that we didn't actually own because I certainly don't want to pay for authority work for something that we might delete down the road. And then we can FTP our discovery records from the Yankee site, and we load them weekly. And at first when we were loading, we would kind of open them in MarkEdit to look at them, see if we were happy with them, but now we feel that they're good to go and we just load them. We don't even bother to look at them anymore. And so here's what a discovery record looks like. And we're pleased. We feel that it's fleshed out enough. It's got enough information. People can find what they need. And, you know, we worked with telling them what we wanted to use for the call number. We use internet for our ebooks. And then we have the 955. We have the Yankee Demand Driven Acquisitions. And then you can see that they've got subject headings and information along that, those lines. And so we're happy with the discovery record and 
feel that that's sufficient information for people to find it. So what's happened in the year? So we've had 204 short-term loans and 67 purchases. And so we've only spent $5,779. So the fears that I have that maybe be out of control were unfounded. It's certainly manageable. This is an amount that, that we are more than comfortable with spending. I was happy to spend even more. And then you can really see the difference between having the larger pool of titles in your DDA collection. Um, from May to December, we only had 31 short-term loans and we had five purchases. So in that eight-month month period, we just had that limited amount. In the next eight-month period, we were up to 173 short-term loans and 62 purchases. And the usage statistics are really kind of mirroring the academic school as a year. We really had a lot, a lot of activity in March, April, May, and June. We have a pretty active summer one session, which happens in June. And so we really, you know, we probably had between 20 to 40 short-term loans each month, and then about 15 purchases during those months. And so it kind of, you could see that it's happening as the academic school year has geared up. Your loans and your purchases are going to increase there and definitely mirrors what's happening in the school year. Now, Yankee will send out an email every time you have a short-term loan. So you'll get an email saying that you had a trigger activity. And sometimes they'll combine a couple of the titles. But you can see, um, certainly as it's happening, what you're spending and what's going on. And then they'll send out an email when you purchase the title and it'll say notice of activity and that then you can see that you've bought the title. So you can see the difference on the emails between the loans and the purchases. But those do come directly to you and so you're able to kind of monitor what's happening and what's going on with your budget because I think we're, we're still concerned about that but you can definitely see what you're spending, what your loans are, and then also look at what people are buying. In May, we had someone who purchased a literary criticism on the Hunger Games, and I was very excited because I didn't think we would have had that title in our collection at that time, but it was certainly right at the height of when the movie was out, and someone who wanted to have literary criticism was able to find some information on the Hunger Games, and they got what they needed. So I felt like in terms of timeliness of the collection, we're certainly there now with our DDA title list because we are loading those titles as they're available and therefore we're making them available to the Creighton community. So then what's happened with the different subject areas? And this is based on the bookstore categories. But as you can see, we're all over the board, but we also kind of mirror where our high number of ebook usage was. Because if if you'll remember when I looked at the categories, business and economics, that was 50% of ebook usage for the collection and checkout. So we had the, certainly that was our highest for a number of loans, but political science, history, and religion, social sciences coming on strong. Um, computers actually get a little bit more usage on the ebook platform than they have gotten for our print collection, so that's nice. But again, having all of the subject areas available was helpful because we certainly are in a wide variety and we're not focused on just one subject area. So it is getting used throughout. And then when you look at the publishers, John Wiley has been very popular, ABC Clio, and then the Paul Grave Macmillan. That was one where they did not allow for a short-term loan and that you had to, if you used it, then you bought it. And so we ended up buying 23 of those titles. And then when I've gone back and looked at the statistics, you can, you'll get a report weekly on kind of your DDA activity. And one of the columns will tell you when the book was last used. And I found that 11 of the titles were only used once. And all of those were the titles that we bought them the first time they were used rather than doing the short-term loan. So now I've removed that feature. So I tried it tried it for you know a semester of having the publishers that did not allow short-term loans. We make those available. But I've changed that. I've gone back to just I want to do a short-term loan and then I want to purchase the title because I feel that's the best use of our pool and the best use of our money because it was certainly the highest usage of the titles that didn't get used again were the ones that we bought on the first time. So that's not alleviating the problem that I was trying to address where we bought things and they never got used. 
And then Taylor and Francis and Cambridge University Press were the kind of the next highest publisher. So certainly publishers that we would buy in the print collection and ebook collection, and we would select ourselves. And what the community is purchasing is matching what our expectations were. And so then we look at kind of the use of the Reinhardt collection from 2011 to 2012. And then we added about 1,000 less of our print titles. We added 3,800. The ebook titles was about the same. And many of that does come from the eBury Academic Complete collection, the Springer collection. Our ebook usage was up to 49%. And then our print circulation was down to 11%. So it kind of matches what I expected. We're kind of holding our own with the print, ebooks taking off, but I really feel like we're making these titles available and they're there for the people to use. So that leads to kind of the DDA questions. What have I found out? What's been addressed? What am I looking at now? Um, what do I need to be concerned about in the future? And I feel that for Creighton, the number of titles in the pool, having it double what you purchase in print each year is a good match. I'm really pleased with the loans and the purchases that we had in the spring semester, and we seem to be on track this fall semester for um, usage that I would expect. So I feel that double what you would buy in print is a good rule of thumb to use. How long should they stay in the pool? Right now we're just going to leave them in for a couple of years going to wait and see what happens. It's um, not really causing any harm to have them there, and we'll certainly make them available and uh, see what happens. Now, what type of reports will you get? Um, Yankee will send out a weekly report telling you the title, what was loan, what was the list price, how much um, the trigger cost. They'll also tell you when the first usage was and when the last usage was. And I find this very helpful because I can see, um, is there a pattern on are they used again? And one of the first titles that we bought, No Fear of Failure, was used for a class one year later in June. And so that kind of shows that you need to give it some time to see where the usage is because Certainly, if it's used in February, it might be used in February again, or it might be used a couple months later. And then when I looked at our purchases to kind of see, do I need to do the short-term loan for a longer period than one day? Right now, I don't really have a definitive answer. We had 11 titles that were only used that one time. Then I've got 10 titles that were kind of used a week later, so maybe for those 10 you know, a one-week short-term loan would have been sufficient. I would have had, not have had to buy it. And then 22 titles were used within the one-month period. And then I've got 24 titles that have been used throughout several months and used again and again. So I don't feel that I need to change our policy to extend the short-term loan period. I'm still happy with one day. And that, um, but certainly something I'm going to monitor and see if that's something I need to change. Right now, maybe a month is sufficient, but we do have most of the titles were used throughout the months, but it's only 35%. So I don't really feel I have a definitive answer yet. And then do we need to purchase cataloging records? We had decided that we would do cataloging records from Yankee. They give you that option. They're $2 a record. Now, as I showed you before, the discovery record's pretty... Uh, fleshed out and has a lot of information. So what we have done is if the title is purchased, then we just change the 001 field. Instead of using the eBray number, which is kind of our signal to ourselves that that's either in the Academic Complete Collection or it's a DDA title, but in other words, we've not purchased it. We change the 001 field to have the OCLC number, so then we know we've bought it. And at that point, we don't really use the cataloging record and we haven't changed it. So I'm probably going to stop purchasing the catalog records and that we're happy with the DDA titles and how those records display and what information they have. And we feel that that's sufficient. And then I kind of looked at, you know, what have I saved? You know, are we doing pretty well in terms of the budget? And looking at the short-term loan titles, 
I spent $1,000 on the loans, but if I had purchased those titles, I would have spent $8,866. So in one year, I've saved close to $8,000 on titles that really were only used that once for a short time, you know, one day, and I haven't, so I haven't bought anything that, you know, wasn't going to be used again. We certainly kind of addressed that issue by having the loan, and then we did have some savings there of $7,800, and so I'm really happy with the way the program is going. And the DBA is kind of matching our print circulation, our highest areas of circulation, our philosophy and religion, language and literature, sociology and history, and that we have seen a lot of activity in those subject areas. And again, business is matching where there was a lot of ebook usage on the eBury Academic Complete area, and so we've had a lot of loans there. And so overall, I feel like I've got some of my questions answered of what I'm doing. Yankee and eBury are constantly kind of refining what they let you know and what's going on. The report has changed a little bit. They used to give you titles that maybe someone looked at the front or end matter but didn't uh, actually trigger a purchase. They no longer do that. Now they're just giving you the list of titles that were a trigger or a purchase. And then also you can go onto the eBray uh, platform. That's where you can get the you can get records, mark records, statute catalog there, but you can also tells you what records need to be deleted. And we've had had some titles that were in the DDA pool that are no longer available on the eBury platform for whatever reason. And so I just go in weekly and kind of delete, and get that report and do the deletes and get the information there. And then the eBury platform, will, you can look at your usage there too and see um, kind of the downloads or the um, page views and things like that. And then I've set it so that we do not download single-use ebooks. For the academic complete collection, since I have multi-users, the people are allowed to download that. But for the titles that just have the single user, we, we're not downloading that. And that's, so that's something to think about and maybe look at. But right now, we're not going to let them download. And so I do feel that I'm getting sufficient information to kind of monitor what's happening with the collection and what I need to do. And I feel that we're also examining our collection more. In previous years, we kind of just bought what the faculty told us to buy. And we still do that to the majority of the extent. But now we're kind of looking at, you know, what areas are getting used? Are they getting used more on the ebook side? Are they getting used more on the print side? Do we need to make um, these titles available? What's going on? And so it's really giving us some information and some ways to think about our collection and managing our collection and what we want to do in the future. And so I'll end with I'm really happy with how the demand driven acquisition program is going and it's certainly something we're going to continue in the future. And that's all I have. If anyone's got any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thanks, Sally. Yes, if anybody has any questions, there are two options for asking them. You can either type them in the question box, and I will see your text question there. Or if you do have a microphone, we currently have you all muted, but if you would type into the question box that you want me to unmute your microphone, I can do that, and then you can just ask your question over the air. So either one of those is an option for asking questions. I know in the past I've been asked, um, you know, for the short-term loans, do I just take that out of the book budget or have I had to take it out of a different account since it's really more of a rental or a lease rather than a purchase, but we're able to just take it out of our book budget and kind of treat it like a purchase. So. Great. That's a good thing to know. We don't have any questions coming in here yet. Perhaps you've just covered everything so thoroughly, Sally. Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you do have any other questions, I'm sure Sally will be more than happy to answer emails after the fact. And you know, you can get in touch with us and we can pass along your questions to her. But 
Oh, we're just a couple more minutes here. If anybody's typing. That's right. And this takes a while. There's a little bit of lag time when we're doing this via online and waiting for people to type things in. It does not look like we're getting any more questions, so I guess I will just say thank you, Sally. This was a great presentation. We're glad you were able to do this for us. Well, thank you very much. And again, feel free to contact me if you have any questions. And thank you, Emily. I really enjoyed uh, getting to present in a webinar. I hadn't done that before, so it's kind of a new experience. Excellent. Me. Well, you did very well. Now, thank you all for attending Encompass Live, and we'll hopefully see you next week.